So the, um, the sermon this morning is, is broken into to two parts with, a, with an intermission in, in the middle. And um, after, after we were talking with people after the, the first sermon today, people, people said, uh, this is a sermon that's going to really ask you to put on your thinking cap. That's what, that's what I was told. So what I want to do at this point in the service is to share a verse from the Bible with you and ask you to reflect on how it sits with you. The verse comes from the New Testament, from Paul's epistle to the Galatians. And this passage may be familiar to you because it's one of the most famous passages in Paul's writings. In Galatians 3.28, Paul writes, There is no longer Jew or Greek, There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. I'll give you the verse one more time. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And I want to ask you some questions about this passage. How many of you feel feel positive about this passage? How many of you have an affinity for what it says? Does anybody like it? We've got some hands going up. All right. And how many of you feel more, more negative about this passage? How many of you experience resistance to what this passage is saying? Got some hands there. All right, good. And I suppose I should ask, how many of you aren't, aren't sure? All right. How many of you don't care? And, and how many, that's got some, I didn't get any hands for that at the first service. So. And how many of you are holding back cautiously waiting to pick a side until you see where I go with this? And so what I, I want to do is I want to hear, we're going to turn this mic, all right, this mic's on. I want to hear from a couple of people who felt positive about it, who liked it. Maybe, raise your hand if you felt positive and are willing to share what you liked about it. Any Anybody? Yes. All right, Ruth. I see a hand there. Ruth, what did you what did you like about it? I like the idea of no divisions among people, and I also take the term Christ as meaning each one of us because it means anointed, and I think as human being, I'm anointed to reach out to other people, and I feel everybody is. All right, Ruth likes it. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share why they why they like it? All right, got down here a young, a young budding theologian in our midst. All right, why did you like it? Well, it seemed like it was just good. It seemed good, yeah, yeah. All right. And anybody who didn't like it are willing willing to share why you didn't like it. Any hands? Yeah, Mary. Yeah, Mary Dell. I, I don't like being labeled a Christian. All right, so you... There's kind of a forced... There's sort of a forced conversion going on there. You too, maybe, maybe. Anybody else didn't, didn't like it? Ruth, all right. All right, Ruth. I liked it and I didn't like it, but the reason I didn't like it is because I don't feel it's right, and particularly as a person who's privileged to be free to assume that the experience of somebody who is a slave doesn't count. Nor is it right for men to assume the experience of being a woman doesn't count or for a woman to experience, feel that the experience of being a man doesn't count. So that part bothers me. So some people find it really uniting and and liberating and others feel that it sort of forces forces a sense of enforced sameness upon us that may be not true. So I want to give you a little background information here. The epistle uh, to the Galatians is thought to be one of the authentic letters of Paul. Biblical scholars believe that Paul didn't write everything that Paul is said to have write, uh, is, was, was supposed to have wrote, but uh, Galatians is one of the ones that we're pretty sure that Paul wrote. We believe that this letter was written in the early to mid-50s, and it was written to early Jewish Christian communities in Galatia, a region in what is now central Turkey. Reading the letters of Paul is, I think, like reading an advice column, like a Dear Abby, 
only you get the advice, but not the letter that asked for the advice. You get the response, but you don't get the question. So, for example, if, if Abby responds, don't let your in-laws stay with you, put them up in a hotel, we don't know what exactly prompted this advice. It could be any number of things. We can only imagine. But, but Abby is probably responding to something specific, something contextual, and is not saying universally that all in-laws are bad categorically and must be put out of your house. So we believe, scholars who study this thing, believe that the emerging Jewish Christian communities in Galatia were experiencing tensions across difference that Jews and Gentiles were coming together in community, but questions were coming up like, do Gentiles that join the community need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow the various practices of Jewish law? Should those coming out of Judaism continue to follow the law, or should they stop following the law? Should all members of the community do the same thing, have the same rules and the same practices, or should... Um, should all differences be abolished in community? And then what parts of one's identity and culture should one have to give up and which parts can you keep? These were the sorts of questions that people were asking. And the answer that Paul gives to the Galatians is there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Jesus. Allow me to bring in a contemporary biblical scholar, Daniel Boyarin, who teaches at UC Berkeley. Boyarin wrote an entire book about Galatians 3.28. Um, and, and this is not, there are actually, if you go into like biblical scholarship, there are entire books on you know, individual verses or, or words and clauses in individual verses. Um, so in his book, about Galatians 3.28, I want you to listen to a few of his reflections on, on what he does with this passage. He says, when Paul says, there is no Jew or Greek, no male and female in Christ, he is raising an issue with which we still struggle. Are the specificities of human identity the differences of value, or are they only an obstacle in the striving for justice and liberation? Paul, we know, was motivated by a Hellenistic desire for the one, which, among other things, produced an ideal of a universal human essence beyond difference and hierarchy. And while Paul's impulse towards the founding of a non-differentiated, non-hierarchical humanity was laudable, many of its effects in terms of actual lives were not. In terms of ethnicity, his system required that all human cultural specificities be eradicated. In terms of gender, autonomy and something like true equality for women were bought at the expense of sexuality and maternity. This very passion for equality led Paul, for various cultural reasons, to equate equality with sameness. His argument, for example, on the subject of whether or not Jews should keep kosher or whether or not Gentiles should follow, follow the Jewish dietary laws is precisely against those who think that what one eats is of significance. It is, however, this very tolerance that deprives difference of the right to be different, dissolving all others into a single essence in which matters of cultural practice are irrelevant and only faith in Christ is significant. Paul's gospel was one of tolerance, but tolerance itself is flawed in Paul as it is today. And tolerance is opposite, by which I do not mean intolerance, but insistence on the special value of particularity is equally flawed. This tension between the same and different in both gender and ethnicity indicates the precise quandary in which our sociocultural formation is trapped through the present. Did that all make sense to you? No. Here is what I think Boyarin is saying in response to Paul. He says, if you say we are all really and truly the same, it becomes an easy temptation to minimize and dismiss differences as unimportant or even as an impediment and threat to togetherness. 
On the other hand, if you say that we are all fundamentally different, that would seem to push us towards separation and isolation in a way that is antithetical to justice and a goal of community. Puzzle on that for a little bit. Let's take an intermission here and uh, we'll come back about what this might mean for us. So this morning we've had the Yiddish oi and we've had the punk oi together. <laughs> so I want to tell you a story from my own experience that illustrates the problems with Galatians 3.28. Um, at the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly last summer, there were these very, very, very cool t-shirts for sale. And I want to show you, they are, uh, I love it, it says, so they are, they say, death and glory, and they have a giant skull and a cross. And, um, um, and so I want to tell you kind of what this, what this t-shirt what this t-shirt is, is all about here. Um, the t-shirts are making reference to a theological dispute within universalism, which is uh, our heritage. Uh, a branch of universalism held the theological belief that upon death, every single person immediately goes to heaven. Don't, don't pass purgatory, don't collect $200. The prevailing belief, though, among universalists at that time had been that following death, you received a period of punishment that was finite, but, but you were eventually restored to heaven. And the go immediately to heaven side was called ultra-universalism, or more colloquially, was referred to as the death, they were referred to as the death and glory universalists. Therefore, this t-shirt, and I told you I was a theology nerd. Um, so it was last summer, and I've just moved here to Chapel Hill, and I decide that I'm going to wear my death and glory t-shirt because, because that day I'm supposed to meet a UU friend for lunch, and I'm meeting my friend at one of the Indian restaurants on Franklin Street, and when I walk into the restaurant, the host, an Indian woman, asks me what my t-shirt means. And I explain that it's a, it's a declaration of a theological stance within, within historical universalism, <laughs> a stance that holds that everybody goes to heaven, no exceptions. And the host frowned. And then it hit me. The host at the Indian restaurant was probably Hindu. Hindus believe in reincarnation. Heaven, hell doesn't make a difference. Let me make this point again. If a strident fundamentalist Christian walked in with a t-shirt that said, repent or burn in hell, we would find that t-shirt offensive, right? We'd say that person was spewing hatred and intolerance. And yet I walked down Franklin Street with a t-shirt that said essentially, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. <laughs> and, and this message was intended as a message of love, a message of universalist love. But it was perceived could have been perceived as a hostility to difference. It's not as mean-spirited as telling someone that they're going to hell, but telling someone that they're going to heaven is also perhaps an, an, a form of insisting on sameness, on sameness in a way that is hostile to difference. Daniel Boyarin, in his book about Paul's epistle to the Galatian, calls Paul the father of Western universalism. Not universalism with a big capital U, but universalism with a lowercase u, pulling everyone and everything into one common body. There are many critiques of lowercase u universalism in contemporary religious scholarship. One of Stephen Prothero's more recent books is entitled God is Not One, The Eight Rival Religions and Why Their Differences Matter. It's a book that is challenging to this idea of small u universalism. It challenges the somewhat sweet, though incredibly naive idea that while the great religions may differ in their particulars, they share a common message and are reducible to a common aim and a common goal. Prothero insists this is not true, and he talks about the great religions of the world as being rivals, which is perhaps discouraging if you believe the world has too much of that rivalry stuff going on. 
What I want to move is, do, is move from the theoretical to the practical. How do we see, how do we see this tension between sameness and difference, between universalism and particularism playing out in our wider triangle community and even in our own church community? Religious life in our greater metro area recently made international news because of the decision over at Duke University to allow Muslim students to broadcast a prayer from the tower of the Duke Chapel, and then the reversal of that decision when the university received backlash and decided to rescind the invitation to the Muslim students. How many of you have heard that story in the news? Yeah. The facts of the situation are fairly simple. Duke University is a private educational institution with Christian origins, having been founded by Methodists and Quakers. Its most notable landmark on campus is its chapel with its 200-foot tower. Of Duke's 15,000 graduate and undergrad students, about 700, or, or 5%, are Muslim. The Duke Chapel had made space available in its basement for a Muslim student group to gather and hold religious services for the past couple of years, and a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that the Muslim student group had received permission to set up a speaker system in the tower and broadcast the adhan, the Islamic call to prayer, for three minutes at a moderate volume, calling Muslim students to their Friday service. The decision upset some people, some people within the university community and especially outside of the university community. Outspoken evangelical Christian Franklin Graham led the charge opposing the prayer and called on Christian alumni to stop making donations to Duke. The university even received threats of violence, saying we will there'll be bombings and shootings if the Muslim students go ahead and broadcast the prayer. And the university reversed course, rescinding the invitation for the students to use the tower. Instead, uh, the Muslim student group set up a portable speaker system in front of the chapel and broadcast the prayer from the sidewalk. Now, there's a lot of things that I might say about this controversy. First of which is that it is an absolute embarrassment for a world-class university like Duke to allow its course of action to be swayed by some clown like Franklin Graham. <laughs> Duke is better than that. Act the part. For over a decade, Graham has been a crusading Islamophobe, a voice of intolerance and hate, an all-around idiot, and even an advocate, and even an advocate for violence. And Duke, in listening to him, got clowned. Next, though, I thought the statement from Duke when it canceled the prayer was telling and also kind of a little bit embarrassing. The statement from the administration, Duke remains committed to fostering an inclusive, tolerant, and welcoming campus for all of its students, said Michael Schoenfield, Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations. However, it was clear that what was conceived, what was conceived as an effort to unify was not having the intended effect. Our Muslim community enriches the university in countless ways. We welcome the active expression of their faith tradition and all others in ways that are meaningful and visible. Which I would add, in ways that are meaningful and visible, but you can't use the tower. If we apply, though, the concept of sameness and difference, universality and particularity to the Duke controversy, it shines a light on this controversy in a different way. I find the use, uh, the administrator's use of the word unify especially interesting. Having Muslims use the Duke Chapel Tower is an effort to unify. And I wonder, is he riffing on Paul? Is he being kind of a Pauline universalist here? At Duke, there is neither Christian nor Muslim, for all are one. And if you can get the Franklin Grahams of the world to kind of quiet down from the margins, some really actual deep questions can be asked that touch on these ideas of sameness and difference. Is the Duke Tower a general religious symbol, or is it a particular Christian symbol? 
as the most iconic building on campus? If it is a Christian symbol, is it a symbol of Christian supremacy? Is it bad theology to broadcast a Muslim prayer from a Christian structure? Are Muslim students wrong in some way or misguided to want to put the speaker up there in a Christian space? Or Christian students right to see this as an intrusion on their unique identity, their own particular identity. Daniel Boyarin, who I keep coming back to, says that tolerance can be flawed when it denies difference of its right to be different. But a special insistence on particularity is problematic as well. It's worth noting that our congregation, the Community Church of Chapel Hill, was founded with some of these Pauline observances about community in mind. Our church was founded as, quote, a spiritual home wherein there is unity in the Christian essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and charity in all things. So we're all together on what matters. We're all, the things we're separate on don't matter and we're supposed to be nice to each other. Um, it, is a, it is a line that, that I think of is, is coming right out, of, right out of Paul's letter to the Galatians, and it's, and it's not a bad message. It only becomes a little bit problematic when I start to label someone else's difference as non-essential, right? Or insist, or insist that, that we have to be together on this because it is essential. How do we go about reconciling tension between sameness and difference, universality and particularity in our own community and in this great multicultural American experiment and within our diverse world? Boyarin makes a bold attempt, a bold and somewhat frightening attempt to reconcile these tensions, calling on all people to adopt what he calls a diaspora identity. He calls on everyone to adopt what he calls a diaspora identity. What is, what is that diaspora identity? In Judaism, we know the diaspora occurred when the temple was destroyed. And so the center of the religion went from being the temple in Jerusalem to being the center nowhere. People spread across the ancient world in their own communities, in Turkey, and in Syria, and in Israel, Palestine, and in Rome, and all throughout the ancient world. Every person sort of a journeyer beyond outside of the center. Boyarin writes, diasporic cultural identity teaches us that cultures are not preserved by being protected from mixing but probably can only continue to exist as a product of such mixing. All cultures and identi identities are constantly being remade. And Boyarin instructs us to think that the two keys to having a diasporic identity is the first is doing away with your claim to exclusive space. That's the first part. That's what it calls for, doing away with a claim to exclusive space. And the second is doing away with the idea that it's possible to practice your identity apart from others with different identities. And so if you put the Duke Chapel example up against Boyarin's theory, he would say that, um, that we run into problems with identity and conflict and destructiveness when one identity has a claim to exclusive privileged space. And so he would say that in this way, this is not a way of holding an identity that leads towards justice. It's a way of holding an identity that makes it so that systems are, are unjust and the idea of community is thwarted. And so I ask, in, in what ways, in what ways do we hold our own individual identities, our common shared UU identity, those identities? Do we hold them in ways that lead to greater justice in our relationships or a deepening of oppression? 
I said this morning was a morning that would make you think. And so I invite you to continue this conversation and to continue to talk about that inherent tension between sameness and difference, between a likeness and difference.